So without further ado, uh, let's get into the session. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Nick Watson, Chair of Disability Studies here at the University of Glasgow, who will be guiding you through today's session and introducing the fantastic speakers that we have today. I really hope you have a great discussion and I look forward to hearing everybody's input. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nick. Good morning, everybody. And thanks very much for joining. And we're really pleased to see such a large number of people interested in what's been a, a what is a, a, a very important topic and I think I think we all know uh, uh, what a catastrophic impact uh, COVID has had on the one and a half million people with learning disabilities in the UK um, not only were they more likely than the general population to contract COVID they were and to experience poorer health outcomes and mortality uh, because of COVID but also their services and support networks were greatly disrupted and this caused a huge uh, 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 disruption to their lives. So I, I don't want to, uh, we want to move straight on into the speakers very quickly, uh, but what we tried to do is we tried to bring together uh, evidence to uh, talk, to look at what's happened in the past, but also importantly, we want to think about what do we need to do to go forward uh, to try and improve uh, uh, things and uh, for people with a learning disability and to help to make up for some of the disadvantage uh, that they've experienced during this uh, during the pandemic. Um, we're going to draw on research from from people with people with a learning disability that we carried out and uh, uh, during COVID. But we also are going to uh, talk to uh, people from the Scottish Learning Disability Observatory to talk about their research, looking at uh, the quantitative data. Uh, and we're going to ask uh, Eddie McConnell from uh, Down Syndrome Scotland to talk about the experiences of people with, a down, with Down syndrome from the experience of a third sector organisation. And uh, we're going to draw on some work that has previously done to look at policy implications as we go forward. Um, so if I could um, go straight into the first speaker, if that's all right, who's going to be uh, Eddie McConnell, who's the uh, Chief Executive Officer for Down Syndrome Scotland. And he's going to be giving a talk, the good, the bad and the ugly reflections on the pandemic from the perspective of the Down syndrome community in Scotland. So thanks very much, Eddie, and over to you. So good morning, everyone, and very many thanks to you all uh, for the invitation to come along today and, and, and offer some reflections from the community that I have the privilege to serve. Uh, I've entitled my presentation, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, and that's very deliberate because uh, I, I do feel at the moment that we're in seeing a lot of appetite within the policy officials to talk about what, what, what good came out of the pandemic. There's some acknowledgement about some of the things that went wrong, the bad. There ain't much appetite to talk about the ugly stuff. And I'm really keen, uh, even though it is uh, a recorded session, Graham, I'm really keen to be free and frank in terms of the reflections from uh, the community, as I say, that I have the privilege to serve. So my name is Eddie McConnell. I'm Chief Executive of Down Syndrome Scotland. Uh, it's an organisation that is 40 years old this year. Um, it has 10 local branches, so very much rooted in the community uh, at neighbourhood level. Uh, and we provide uh, support and services and advice to families uh, and to directly to people with Down syndrome all over Scotland. Um, we, are, we are not uh, a social care provider, uh, and uh, we, we are what I refer to sometimes as a first order charity. So we are very much a charitable organisation providing services free of charge to, to people in need. Um, a couple of quick disclaimers at the top before I move with pace through the presentation, because I've got so much I want to share, but I'm really keen to get to the discussions uh, afterwards. So uh, disclaimers for me, uh, in addition to my day job, uh, I'm also the privileged uh, father of a young, young man uh, with Down syndrome, young Finlay, and I'm going to shamelessly plug his Instagram account. So if any of you want to see what... Uh, Living a good life with Down syndrome is all about. Uh, please check out at ops with Downs underscore. And um, Finley would be delighted uh, to have more followers on his Instagram account. Um, I also chair the Scottish Commission for People with Learning Disabilities. So I've drawn on some of my experiences and some uh, of the work that that great organisation does over there. But on the whole, uh, the views and the opinions that I offer today are uh, directly uh, informed and uh, from families that we serve, we have 1,300 members across Scotland uh, and from people with Down syndrome in terms of what they experienced. So, so 
So context, uh, they do say that timing is everything. Uh, I, in fact, arrived in post three months before the pandemic, so my timing is never great. Um, uh, uh, and uh, after my first three months, we were keen as a group, as a team, as in Scotland, to relaunch the charity. Uh, and of course, that opportunity was pretty much swept away from under our feet uh, as we began to get to terms with uh, COVID-19. Uh, I recall uh, at a meeting of our board in January, 2020, uh, uh, under any other business, uh, our chairman said, do we need to think about this virus that, that's currently being reported? Uh, uh, if ever there was an understatement, that was it. Um, so as I said, we were gearing up to relaunch the charity in March 2020, when of course, national lockdown hit. It, it resulted in the cancellation of our annual awareness week, a loss of 70 to 80 thousand pound of income. We immediately moved to furlough half of our staff group and eventually we had to make a third of our staff redundant. And we did all of that against a backlog of a threefold increase in demand for services. And I'll explain where, those, where that demand came from and why that demand arose. So that was the challenging context for us entering the pandemic. So let's talk about the good. Um, so the good uh, is that within six weeks, we mobilised our online delivery. Like many third sector organisations, we recognised it was really important to keep people connected, keep people safe and keep people informed. Um, and uh, like a number of third sector organisations, we adopted the digital approach uh, and, and moved quickly, very quickly, uh, to keep people connected, as I say. Um, our digital approach had additional benefits in that we extended our reach as a charity. So it became the case that it didn't matter where you lived in Scotland, as so long as you had an internet connection, we could actually connect with you and connect you with others. So we had people in Orkney being supported by people in Dumfries. Um, so that was a huge benefit. And it didn't matter if you didn't live in the central belt of Scotland, you had equal access to our support and advice and connecting with other members uh, in the charity. Uh, just one qualification to that, of course, we do know that digital exclusion remains a significant challenge for a significant part of the learning disability community. The additional good things to report is that emergency funding became available quickly and was issued on the basis of trust and mutual respect. Really positive moves very quickly by government uh, and also by the big funders to recognise that third sector organisations uh, were pivotal in supporting people. Uh, in those vulnerable communities and that uh, funding would, would need to be moved quickly to them to allow them to uh, respond to, the, to those, those requests and support the national effort in terms of information. We witnessed, uh, and I certainly felt, great collaboration across sectors. Uh, it became the norm at the start of the pandemic and through the early first year of the pandemic. You saw brilliant solutions coming forward to really wicked problems. You know, I would cite, I would give an example of the speed at which um, a number of the homeless charities, including the Simon community, moved to uh, work across uh, with public sector colleagues and with the private sector to ensure that every single homeless person was actually off the street within three to four weeks of the start of the pandemic. So that for me was a tremendous example of the kind of collaboration and the brilliant solution to a wicked problem. And of course, lots of people said to us, but that can't be done. Uh, and it just shows you what can be achieved and actually nobody cares who gets the credit. Um, and we began to understand quite early on that accessible information was recognised as key. And we did see some really good examples of government in particular, uh, recognising the need to go beyond simply the production of easy read to think about how the information could be more accessible to the, the, the diversity of communities uh, really affected and particularly the learning disability community. So that's the good. I make no apology uh, for wanting to talk about that and the ugly. I think the best learning uh, from this pandemic in terms of informing new policies going forward will come from an, an honest and truthful account uh, and examination of what was ugly and what was bad in the pandemic. Um, and I am increasingly intolerant, I have to say, of people who, who just simply want to focus on what, what, what was good and, and, and brush over uh, some of the really challenging stuff. Um, the reason I focus on that is not to apportion blame or involve myself in any way in recrimination. We were all learning deeply, but we did get some things wrong and we got them badly wrong. So it's really important that we take the time to, to understand uh, why things went wrong uh, so that we can inform policy going forward. The five things I wanted to highlight in terms of the bad. Um, there is no doubt, that, 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 as Nick mentioned in his, in his opening remarks, the social care providers 
cancel support overnight, um, and uh, uh, and in some cases, a number of the social care providers sought continued payment from uh, some from from some families to guarantee a future provision, which seemed remarkable because nobody really knew what future provision would look like, far less when future provision would come back. Um, we began to see the language of the pandemic uh, offering us the first hints of discrimination. Um, with uh, Some of you may remember the early reports of early deaths of the pandemic were always qualified with. Uh, today we report 15 deaths, uh, the majority of whom uh, were people with underlying health conditions, um, almost as if it didn't really matter. Uh, they didn't really count because they had underlying health conditions. And we knew from the intelligence we were gathering at a local level that underlying health conditions was also a euphemism for learning disability, and in our case, people with Down syndrome. We believe that people with Down syndrome were not recognised uh, quickly enough as, as being vulnerable and at risk, despite the known comorbidities, you know, particularly around the immune dysfunction and respiratory infection. These should have been triggers, we believe, for public health officials to have recognised and, and it required a bit of a campaigning and a push and, and ultimately required Oxford University, the Oxford University study that included uh, people with Down syndrome uh, and recognised that they were 10 times more likely to uh, die should they contract uh, COVID. And that that figure uh, increased exponentially over the age of 40 for the Down syndrome community as opposed to the general population where it was over the age of 70. And, and, and armed with that, uh, information uh, and, and that research uh, from Oxford University, the chief medical officers uh, took the decision, uh, some feel a bit too late in, in November 2020, uh, to add uh, people with Down syndrome to the clinically extremely vulnerable group. And more broadly, I have to say it was quite clear, although we were focused on uh, our community, it was quite clear that people with learning disabilities were increasingly invisible and significant gaps in data was reinforcing their invisibility. And so to the ugly, um, uh, one, one of the things we spotted very early on was, um, and this came from reports from families, uh, the inappropriate use of the clinical frailty scale uh, to deprioritize people for life-saving treatment. And we intervened very quickly. I, and I have to say credit to the Scottish Government and the Chief Medical Officer's Office uh, for responding so quickly when we were able to provide them with the evidence that uh, some clinicians were deprioritizing people just because they had a learning disability or they had Down syndrome uh, and using their clinical frailty scale inappropriately to deprioritize for, as I say, life-saving treatment. As if that wasn't bad enough, we then started receiving phone calls from our uh, members about uh, being con them being contacted by GPs and clinicians to open a discussion about uh, the introduction of do-not resuscitate orders. I remember vividly one phone call I, I became engaged with, uh, with an 81-year-old mum who was really confused because the GP had phoned her to talk about her 40-year-old son with Down syndrome and perhaps it would be a good idea to put a do not resuscitate order in now just in case he might find himself in hospital. She was really confused because she had significant health problems, she had a heart condition, and she was, the reason she was confused is she thought the GP should have been talking about her. Uh, rather than her son. And it was a blatant example of uh, the inappropriate use of somebody's genetic condition. Uh, um, and uh, probably one of the worst examples we've seen uh, of a diagnostic overshadowing taking place. These were not isolated examples. There was quite a number of people reporting these conversations taking place with, with families about putting do not resuscitate orders in place. That cannot and must not happen again. Um, and, and, and then we had uh, considerable challenges around uh, fighting to get people with Down syndrome onto the shielding list. So there was a gap between the national announcement and the practice at a local level. Uh, and we saw that uh, uh, quite significantly. We were in touch with many GP practices, trying to explain to them that people with Down syndrome are on the shielding list and they should be getting access to support and they should be prioritised for vaccination. It seemed to me that there was a significant gap between that national policy intent and statements and what was happening at a local level. And we were often having to inform people locally of what the latest guidance was. Um, and then we arrived into the vaccination world, uh, and, and, and I've used quite a strong word here to describe the initial approaches around vaccination were, for us, we felt very chaotic, uh, very disruptive to families, uh, very inconsistent approach across Scotland, and, and, and some reports of the use of sedation to sedate people so they could be vaccinated, uh, people with Down syndrome. 
Um, in one case, uh, I spoke to uh, a mum and uh, a dad who were in their late 70s. Mum and dad had been sent to separate vaccination centres and their 39-year-old daughter was sent to a third vaccination centre, all on different dates. Uh, and and the, the level of disruption and stress that that caused the two elderly people who don't drive uh, in trying to organise that, I can't understand why a family-centred approach wasn't taken. Uh, and it's really important uh, we think about that going forward. And now today we see uh, what we regard as an indecent speed to return to normal, with very little consideration being given to the needs of the most vulnerable. And we saw that most recently with the uh, unilateral uh, announcement of the ending of the high-risk list uh, at the end of this month, uh, with really complex texts being issued to adults with Down syndrome, some of whom misread the text and, and thought this was an announcement that the pandemic was over and everything was okay. Uh, so we saw... Uh, a really disappointing uh, collapse of the earlier collaboration, the earlier understanding about accessible information and the need to work together. Um, and, and it seems that this indecent speed to return to the normal is, uh, uh, is consequently uh, meaning that vulnerable communities are in increasingly at risk. What have we learned? I did think of uh, suggesting that, uh, I, might, I might just say in this slide, what have we learned? Not an awful lot. Um, but let, let's try and do a wee bit of balance as I close my presentation. I think we did learn that anything is possible when confronted by a common enemy. And as I said before, uh, particularly when nobody cares who gets the credit and we work across sectors and across uh, silo boundaries. We did learn, sadly, that inequality and discrimination look really just beneath the surface. So in 40 years of making great progress, what we believe great progress in terms of the disability movement, uh, we were all shocked to see just how quickly discrimination and inequality uh, came forward uh, and, and, and just literally sits just beneath the surface. They often say that truth is the first casualty of war. Well, in our case, I think human rights became the first casualty of this war. Um, data is clearly king in all of these situations. And if gaps in data exist, you don't exist. And that's really, uh, really, really concerning and does link to the previous point around individual human rights. I do think the third sector rose to the challenge. They stepped in and they stepped up and, and we were key to the national response, the national emergency response, absolutely key. But I don't think that's consistently recognised and uh, as such. And uh, I think we're, we're rapidly returning to the place where people tilt their heads when I introduce myself as working for a charity. Oh, that's lovely um, uh, that you work for a charity and don't understand the, the pivotal and critical role that we actually contributed. Uh, and I think... Uh, unless we do something about that status and understanding, then we'll revisit some of these challenges in the future. Uh, people with Down syndrome, their families and carers are some of the most resilient people around. Uh, um, but but that shouldn't be taken, like, you know, shouldn't be taken for granted. And, and, and for too often and it was taken for granted. And many of our unpaid carers were literally on their knees with exhaustion, uh, trying to provide that safe care uh, with very little support. And finally, the mental health impact of the pandemic, I do believe is not fully understood. It's talked about, but I'm not sure it's fully understood. And I think we also need to prepare ourselves for patent trauma to emerge from the past two years. I'll finish my presentation to leave you with two quotes from two people with Down syndrome who have had the privilege to have had fairly deep uh, conversations. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to offer those reflections. It was uh, fast paced because uh, I'm conscious there are many other speakers today. If you want to be in touch with me, that's my contact details. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion later. Back to you, Nick. Thanks very much, Eddie. That was fantastic and a great scene setting to, to, to show us to talk about uh, uh, the experiences of a, of a particular community and, and a, a really nice presentation. Um, we're going to move on to the um, the next uh, talk, which is by uh, Angela Henderson, who's the Director of Policy and Impact at the Scottish Learning Disability Observatory. Uh, and she's going to talk about uh, COVID deaths and outcomes in adults with learning disability in Scotland. She's going to present uh, empirical evidence on this uh, uh, quantitative evidence. So thanks very much. And over to you, Angela. Thanks, Nick. 
Um, and thanks, Eddie, for that really important reflection on the impact of um, COVID-19 on um, the population with Down syndrome. And I fully agree with your approach <laughs> that we really do need to be brutally honest about the impact of COVID on um, marginalised groups such as people with learning disabilities. So um, as Nick said, I'm Angela Henderson and I work at the Scottish Learning Disabilities Observatory, um, which is based in the University of Glasgow and was set up um, to address the um, lack of visibility um, in data that Eddie mentioned in his presentation about the health of people with learning disabilities um, in Scotland. So Scotland um, produces um, huge amounts of public health data to support policy and practice, but very little of that um, actually reports separately on um, at health outcomes for people with learning disabilities. And if we are going to address the health inequalities that um, people of all ages um, with learning disabilities experience, then we really need to understand um, the, the patterns and, and causes of these health inequalities. So I'm going to start um, my presentation um, looking at um, some dates, some analysis. And for me, um, this experience of, of doing this study really emphasised um, the need for better systems for reporting outcomes for the population with learning disabilities um, and the urgent need to improve the visibility of people with learning disabilities in data, as Eddie said earlier. And, and I think this need um, is essential. It's not just from a research perspective, but also has um, important clinical information implications, um, which were seen um, in the rollout of the vaccine, where there were significant challenges were reported in identifying people with learning disabilities to invite them for um, vaccination. And that was evidenced by um, some of the um, conversations that Eddie reported in his presentation. So um, previous research by the observatory um, has underscored the need uh, that the increased risk of um, death from respiratory disease and this really uh, in the population with learning disabilities and this really led us to have some serious concerns about the impact of COVID-19 um, on the population with learning disabilities in Scotland and the need for us to quantify this impact. So in um, May 2020, um, the Scottish um, Learning Disabilities Observatory met with Scottish Government and National Records of Scotland to discuss the viability of using um, Scotland's census data linked to um, um, health data sets, um, including those that report um, on COVID infection to investigate um, the impact on people with learning disabilities in Scotland. Um, and we were granted um, permission eventually to do this analysis um, and were able to link um, Scotland's census with data from Public Health Scotland's COVID um, data set. Um, and this was approved by Scotland's public benefit and privacy panels. And on the 4th of February um, 2021, so quite a big gap between our kind of initial intention to do this analysis and us actually completing the study, we were able to publish some preliminary findings from um, this um, study, which um, indicate, which demonstrated that people with learning disabilities were at greater risk from COVID mortality. Um, in Scotland using data from Scotland um, and on the 22nd of um, February 2021 man, we were really happy that, um, that this study was referenced um, and, and I think I hope that it was um, instrumental in the decision for Scottish Government to um, add people with learning disabilities onto the vaccine prioritisation list. So at the point of us um, starting out on this study, um, there was 
very little good quality evidence on the increased risk of COVID-19 in the population with learning disabilities and much of the data um, that was available um, had significant limitations including for example studies that were mainly focused just on residential settings or using very um, small subsections of the population. One study which did um, receive a lot of coverage, um, which was published by Public Health England um, and drew on a number of different um, data sets which were available esti to estimate the risk of death from COVID, um, um, suggested that people with learning disabilities were between 2.3 and 3.1 times um, a greater risk of death from COVID than those in the general population. And the other study, um, again, the one that Eddie um, referred to, um, which also included, which was an early study that included um, reports on the impact on people with learning disabilities was by Oxford University. And this study was designed to develop a COVID risk prediction tool. So drawing on data from over 8 million GP records, and they reported a 30 six percent higher risk of death in males and females with learning disabilities and a much greater risk of death for people with down syndrome for men that was 10 times higher and for women over 32 times higher so at the stage at which we were doing this there was still quite significant gaps in the evidence it was quite early on in the pandemic so as stated earlier um, at the observatory, we thought it was vital that we were able to produce some analysis to support public health policy making in Scotland and to advocate for the inclusion of people with learning disabilities um, on the um, clinically vulnerable um, list and, and subsequently prioritisation for vaccine. Um, so the aim um, of this study was to investigate in the whole population of adults with learning disabilities, COVID infection rates, severe infection, uh, mortality rates, case fatality and excess deaths and to compare these, um, the, these outcomes um, with people who didn't have learning disabilities. Um, and the data we had was for quite early on within the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we had data from 24th of January 2020, which was the date of the first um, infection um, in the UK, up to the 15th of August, which was the date at which we extracted um, data on COVID outcomes for um, Scottish population. So um, as um, uh, we, as I said earlier, we um, extracted data from Scotland's census, which um, identifies people with learning disabilities, asked people if they had a learning disability. And we found that this um, data, which is this um, questionnaire, which was rigorously tested with the population prior to the census is a is a, ro a robust method of identifying the population within Scotland um, with learning disabilities and it covers the whole population and everybody within um, private households and we were able to link this to um, COVID-19 laboratory test results that were held by Public Health Scotland, hospital admissions to look at um, hospital admissions um, due to COVID, and of course, death registrations. So overall, um, we had just over 255,000 records that were successfully linked to the Community Health Index spine. And that resulted in um, over 17,000 um, records for adults with learning disabilities and almost 165,000 um, linked records for our 5% um, general population comparison. And as expected, there were more fe males than females in the learning disability cohort. So um, with this data, we first conducted a crude analysis of the outcomes of interest. So um, we found 126 um, laboratory confirmed infections in the learning disabilities group and 871 in the much bigger general population comparison group. 
which equated to 905 infections per 100,000 for people with adults with learning disabilities and 521 per 100,000 for people in the general population. The severe infections, which um, were um, classified as infections that resulted in either hospitalisation or death, um, we found 75 um, people in this group with learning disabilities and 404 um, in our 5% sample with no learning disabilities, which equates to 538 people with learning disabilities per 100,000 experiencing severe infection compared to 242 per 100,000 in our comparison sample. Overall, um, for the, in this short period um, of the pandemic, we identified 36 deaths in the population with learning disabilities. So in summary, <clears throat> based on our sort of initial crude analysis, we found that people with learning disabilities were almost twice as likely to become infected with COVID-19, over two times more likely to have severe infection, um, and in terms of case fatality, 28.5% of people with learning disabilities died following COVID infection, compared to 22.3% of the general population. But in order to account for some of the differences within um, these groups, we standardised our analysis for age, sex and deprivation to um, ascertain um, COVID mortality ratios. So overall, we found that people with learning disabilities were 3.26 3 times more likely to die from COVID than people in the general population following standardization that the risk for males was greater than that of females at 3.5, uh, sorry, 3.7 times. And the mortality ratio was also higher um, for those in the least deprived areas at 3.9 times greater risk. And for the younger age groups, mortality risk was even higher. Um, it was 7.47 times higher for adults who were aged 50. 54 or younger and um, 19, point, uh, 19 um, times higher for those aged between 55, 55 and 64. Um, however, there's because um, there were relatively small numbers within this, there isn't a, quite a large note of caution um, with these breakdowns and you can see that within the wide confidence intervals. So in summary then, when age, sex and deprivation were taken into account, people with learning disabilities were 2.6 times more likely to have severe infection, that is to either um, to an infection that resulted in hospitalisation or death. Males were at greater risk of death than females, and those in younger age groups as well were at much greater risk. So again, um, what we heard around the time of the um, of, of the first wave of the pandemic was very much an emphasis on the risk factors for older people um, in, in terms of COVID. However, when we look at data from the um, learning disabilities population, we find that adults with, of all ages are at significantly greater risk of severe infection or death. So one of the final aims of this study was to investigate excess mortality also due to COVID to really look at the broader impact of COVID on, um, on deaths in the population uh, um, to investigate whether there'd been an overall increase in all cause mortality um, in 2020 the, the, during the first phase of the pandemic. And so to do this, we looked at the average um, standardized mortality ratio for the same period, um, that is January to August, for the previous five years before um, the COVID pandemic. Um, and in the five years before the pandemic, the COVID, uh, sorry, the um, standardized mortality ratio was 2.39 times higher. So the risk of death 
um, for people with learning disabilities um, was 2.39 time, times that of the general population, even before COVID. And what we observed was that when we looked at the all-cause mortality in 2020, that actually the, um, the standardised mortality ratio had increased um, only slightly to 2.5. Um, and, and for us, that really demonstrated that, that the learning disabilities, the health and the pre-existing health inequalities that people with learning disabilities experience is, is really, there's already a pre-existing excess mortality within this population. Um, so in summary, overall, um, our study found that adults with intellectual disabilities were more likely to be infected with COVID-19 and that they had a worse prognosis once they were infected. So they were twice as likely to become infected in the first place, 2.2 times more likely to have severe infection resulting in hospitalisation or death and had higher case fatality than the general population. So the risk of severe or fatal COVID relative to those in the general population was much higher in the, in the younger adult age groups and particularly in the age groups between 55 and 64. And interestingly, um, when we looked at excess deaths, we didn't find um, a, a huge increase in excess deaths, which we really attribute to the fact that of, of pre-existing health inequalities in this population. There were um, quite a number of limitations within our studies. So um, because we did um, this study early on, um, the data that we were able to access was for a short period right at the beginning of the pandemic. So there were a small number of um, cases that re reduced the reliability of our results. Um, and a high probability that there was an underestimate of potential infections because our study only looked at laboratory confirmed cases. And at the time of our study, there was very limited access to community based testing. And as Eddie's um, said, the risk to people with Down syndrome was not reported in our study um, because we weren't able to disaggregate um, data. Um, within the learning disabilities population. And we also weren't able to look at the differential impact of COVID on um, people with um, more severe learning disabilities compared to those with milder learning disabilities. But the implications for us were still quite stark. Um, we advocated for um, the importance of non-pharmaceutical intervention, so access to personal protective equipment, which were vital in minimising transmission, particularly in a group of people who perhaps had more people coming into their daily lives um, to provide care and support. Critically, um, we were advocating closely with the Scottish Government to um, include all adults with learning disabilities um, on the vaccine prioritisation list. Um, and I think this study does indicate that there's a real need for further analysis of data of subsequent um, waves of the pandemic, including the current period. Um, and also a better understanding of what the specific risk factors are for people with learning disabilities that lead to um, increased risk of, of mortality and severe infection. Um, and as I said, the con in conclusion, um, this study was important because it did quantify the overall increased risk um, the, of COVID-19 infection and mortality and underscored that people with learning disabilities had a worse prognosis um, when infected. So from the observatory's point of view, we're keen to analyze further waves of data in Scotland to analyze outcomes also for people with autism and to investigate further the risk factors for COVID infection and mortality in the population with learning disabilities. Thank you very much. I know we're not taking questions, um, so I'm happy to answer any questions in the um, chat or in the later discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Angela. That was great. Um, it's been a really um, 
grim morning. Not, not, not in terms of the quality of the papers, it's just, it's just the stories. And I don't know if it's going to get much better. It's, can I just check, is Nat, Nat, are you on? Uh, uh, we've, we're on We've, we've got a bit, we've gone, we've got Nat's trying to, is, is coming in from uh, Zambia at the moment, and uh, I think, understand he's lost his internet connection, is that right? I, I don't think he's back yet, Nick, Not so... Um, yeah. Uh, could we ask, Amanda and Roseanne, are you ready to, to step in? Can you, right, okay, so, uh, sorry, we'll, we'll get, hopefully get Nat back on, we've, it's quite, we've got, Roseanne's coming in from uh, Palestine this morning, I think, isn't that right? And then... Nat from gets from God, it's a different world. Okay, right. Um, so we could move to uh, uh, Amanda Galuli and Roseanne McGuire, who are, um, are going to talk about in, the interface to policy and practice there from the Institute of Health and Wellbeing at the University of Glasgow. So over to you two. Thanks. Um, hi everyone, um, so Rosanna and I are going to be talking about some of the findings from the Coronavirus and People's Learning Disability Study today. Um, so this study has been led by Professor Chris Hatton um, at Manchester Metropolitan University and Professor Richard Hastings at the University of Warwick and funded by the UK Research and Innovation Medical Research Council. So the survey um, aimed to examine how people's learning disabilities coped with the unfolding events during the coronavirus pandemic. And we recruited participants from across the UK, from Scotland, and Northern Ireland and Wales. Um, and the teams in each country um, worked with collaborating partners and um, supporting people with learning disabilities. Um, so as you can see from this slide, there was a lot of different organisations involved. In Scotland, the um, project has been led by Professor Andrew Jehoda, um, and Andrew Rosanna and I have been working with the Scottish Commission for People with Learning Disabilities and PAMIS on this work. Um, so we had uh, two groups of participants. We um, directly interviewed adults with learning disabilities um, via Zoom or by phone call. Um, and for adults with more severe learning disabilities, we were not able to take part in an interview. There was an online survey um, completed by family members or paid creators on behalf of the person they support. So we um, interviewed or, and surveyed people three times across um, between December 2020 and the summer of 2021. And at the start, we spoke to over 600 adults with learning disabilities and almost 400 creators completed an online survey, with 167 people completing an online survey on behalf of the person with PMLD. And so a big thank you to everyone who took part. And we're really grateful for everyone sharing their experiences with us. So a broad range of topics were covered in the interviews and surveys, including health and well-being, health and social care services, digital use, friendships, and the impact of caring. The surveys and interviews were developed with direct consultation with the advisory groups of people with learning disabilities and family creators in the Four Nations, and with direct consultations before each of the new survey waves, so that any new emerging issues could be um, included. And after the surveys in Scotland, we held dissemination events um, attended by family carers, people with learning disabilities, organisations, and the views at these events really helped with the interpretation of the research findings and guided the development of recommendations which came out of the study. So today we're going to be talking about some of the key findings from the research um, and the recommendations in relation to these. Um, we will be talking about UK data, um, but the findings across the four nations are largely similar. Um, and the recommendations were within a um, Scottish policy context, but they are general and so could be considered with another context. So people's learning disabilities were worried about the coronavirus across the year. With the greatest worry being um, people were worried about their friend, family or friends getting coronavirus. When we last spoke to people in August of 2021, 70% of people were worried about family or friends getting coronavirus, and 58% of people worried about themselves catching coronavirus. 
The results have an impact on people's emotional well-being and feelings of loneliness. When we first spoke to people um, at, in December 2020, the majority of people with learning disabilities reported being worried, sad, angry and frustrated and lonely with no one to talk to. When we spoke to people um, in the summer of 2021, while things had improved a little bit, the majority of people were still worried, sad, angry, frustrated, and 41% of people reported being lonely. Similar findings were also reported by the creators of people with more significant learning disabilities. At wave two, the majority of people with more severe and profound learning disabilities were reported to experience um, anxiety, sadness, and anger and frustration, with le very little sign of improvement by our third wave in August 2021. So based on these findings and the views of um, people within uh, our dissemination events, the following recommendations were made. Firstly, there needs to be additional funding and resource to ensure support is provided to those whose emotional well-being has been negatively affected during the pandemic. And secondly, official communication which reported to contribute to anxiety. So future communication should be more easily accessible. Suggestions by people with learning disabilities included increasing font size, use of colour, and presenting information in alternative formats, such as audio and video. We also asked um, questions regarding access with health and social care professionals. Over 64% of um, people with learning disabilities and people with more significant learning disabilities um, were reported to have had no contact with health professionals at the final wave of data collection in August 2021. Where there was contact, this was more often remote compared to face-to-face. -face. For example, 20% of people with learning disabilities had a virtual contact with their GP compared to 14% face-to-face. And of those people who usually have a learn an annual health check, less than 40% reported that they had had their health check in 2021. 40% of people had also been waiting at least six months for a medical test, operation or hospital appointment. For people with um, more significant learning disabilities, there was a bigger gulf between virtual and in-person GP consultations. And this is particularly noteworthy, um, as many people with more significant learning disabilities would be less able to verbally report on their symptoms of um, distress. Less than a third of people with um, significant learning disabilities were reported to have had um, an annual health check in 2021. 44% of people have been waiting at least six months for a medical test, operation, or hospital appointment, and one fifth of people had a medical test, operation, or hospital appointment cancelled in the last month. Over a quarter of people were also reported to have had a new or worsening health condition in the last four weeks. Based on these findings, the following recommendations are made with regards to access to health services. Consideration needs to be given to prioritising face-to-face GP consultations for people with learning disabilities, particularly those with more severe learning disabilities. Annual health checks for people with learning disabilities need to be prioritised going forward. And addressing any deterioration in the health and wellbeing of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities needs to be a priority of allied health professional services. Okay, I'm Move on to Rosanne. I'm going to take over here. Unmute myself. Thank you. Um, I'm Rosanne McGuire and I worked on this research project with Andrew and Amanda at Glasgow University. Um, as we've already, as Eddie has already mentioned, the closure of services for people and the lack of uh, support at the beginning of the pandemic had a dramatic effect. Over a quarter of people with learning disabilities and 58% of people with more severe learning disabilities had used day services before the pandemic started. And at the first wave of data collection, almost all day respite and support services, uh, community activities had stopped. But by August 2021, um, we can see that almost two thirds of people um, are back attending in person with some attending online. But it's start to see that 27% of people with learning disabilities and 37% of those with more severe learning disabilities had not yet returned to day services in person. Um, now, we don't know how many people 
the extent to which people um, have returned to their day services at pre-pandemic levels. But we do know that, for instance, 9% of people in cohort one, which is people with learning disabilities, and 25% of people in cohort two had only been attending the day services less than once a week. And around about a fifth of people in both cohorts were back four to five days, but we don't really know um, too much more. Sorry, Amanda, can you? Thank you. Um, so we know support has not returned to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and now many people are still getting less support. Um, as you can see, that, sorry, excuse me, by the final time point in August 21, slightly more than a quarter of people with um, more severe learning disabilities said they were receive, receiving less support. And um, 50, over half of carers of people with more severe learning disabilities were see, receiving less support. Now, this pandemic brought to the fore long standing concerns about access to support and services for people with learning disabilities, particularly in relation to contingency planning and young adult transitions. Um, for families and uh, people with learning disabilities, it heightened their sense of vulnerability. They were expressed many fears about particularly what would happen if um, they were to become ill themselves with COVID. And these concerns highlighted the lack of funding that they've been used to for many, many years, and also the disparity between policy aspirations and the everyday lived experiences of people with learning disabilities and their families. In terms of recommendations, unsurprisingly, the view was the full reopening of day services and community activities for people with learning disabilities to be prioritised. Provision of online support should be an addition and not a replacement for in-person support. And it was suggested that there should be a national hub where ideas for best practice could be collated and shared across Scotland. Perhaps some of the examples that Eddie gave could then be looked at in relation to what we can do now. And this might include day services, community activities, access to allied health professionals. The key thing was that the hub should be work in partnership with people with learning disabilities and their families. Um, as has been said before, families have struggled to cope with greatly reduced levels of support, resulting in negative impacts on their physical and mental well-being. And the pressure on families is unsustainable, and it was very much the, the voice of carers with people with learning disabilities that um, people with PMLD, need, the care packages need to be reinstated. Broader consideration needs to be given to the ability of families and people with learning disabilities themselves in order they can help plan their transitions, including the move from the family home. The feeling coming very strongly from people with learning disabilities and family carers was that the rhetoric should be in line with reality. We don't know, the survey didn't tell us um, how many people were uh, engaged with community activities prior to the pandemic. But at the last wave of survey data in um, August 2021, we know that 45% of people were attending community activities in person, those people with learning disabilities, and 11% were involved in online activities, whereas 36% of people with more severe learning disabilities and 6% of those um, were doing online activities Quick mathematical calculation would then tell us that 44% of people with learning disabilities and 58% of people with more severe learning disabilities were not involved in any community activity in August 2021. So without this support and opportunity to engage in social activity, um, people will become more lonely, depressed. So this is an essential aspect of support. So it's recommended that proactive measures should be taken to support people's need for social contact and activity. And there is a need for both online and face-to-face -face services. Prior, um, during the pandemic, 92% of people with learning disabilities at the last uh, wave of data collection were using online. And 74% of people with more severe learning disabilities had access to the internet. 
if we look at what they were doing in August 2021, 61% of people with learning disabilities compared to 34% of people with more profound learning disabilities were still enjoying being engaged in online activities. Whereas 26% of people with learning disabilities, 44% of those with more severe learning disabilities had never been keen and were not keen to be involved in online activity. So whilst people with learning disabilities should be supported to use online platforms, particularly those who develop lots of new skills and a real enthusiasm for online, building in new opportunities for digital engagement, online activities should be an addition to though rather than a replacement for face-to-face -face activities. Specialist online activities and supports are required for people with more severe and profound learning disabilities, but it should also be acknowledged that for some people, online resources are not appropriate. Now, it's already been said by Eddie, and we all know the impact of caring um, on the carers um, who were left on their own, many of them having to cope by themselves. And this impact continues. Um, over 50% reported feeling uh, general feelings of stress, tired and disturbed sleep, with 40% feeling depressed, 34% by the time we got to wave three. Um, so some people are still leading very restricted lives. 19% um, people in August 2021 were still shielding. And for people who didn't live with family, half had some restrictions imposed on visits from family, friends, or professionals. And Hi, that, Roseanne, Roseanne, sorry to butt in. Can, one minute, is that okay? Thanks. Okay. Sorry, yeah, it's just one, just a one-minute warning. Sorry, that was. All oh, right, was, sorry, right. Oh God, sorry, one minute more. Sorry, Nick. right. So, for people who didn't live with family, half had some restrictions, and five percent were still not allowed any visits from family or friends. Um, so, just to say that this had a very negative impact. Carers report a very negative impact on people. Um, Fifty over fifty-five percent. Last slide, Amanda. So, recommendations for this was that um, anticipation anticipatory care plans need to be put in place. And in the event that carers become unwell and are unable to continue their care role, but there needs to be a mandatory duty to implement the care plans. It's not enough just to have it. And in relation to any future visiting restriction, restrictions, there's a need for individualized risk assessments that take account of individual factors and put the person with the learning disabilities at the center of the risk assessment process. The key thing is that people with learning disabilities and their carers are involved at all stages of any assessment processes. Um, I'm going to finish very quickly by putting up one um, slide from a little video clip from people that were involved in our advisory group saying what they want to come out of all the research that's been done. What do you hope comes from the project? So we've got the findings now. So what would you hope that happens with the findings? It's going to help organisations become better because the, the information that they've managed to get from you know the researchers and from interviewing people with learning disabilities all make organisations grow better because they'll have a better understanding. And one thing I'd hope that comes out of this is that we aren't we aren't pushed to the end of the pile of the papers again. That we're actually put on the top and need a priority. Thanks. Thanks very much. That was sorry. That, thanks very much. That that was great. And and um, unfortunately, Nat can't uh, be with us. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the talk because I was with I did this work with him. Uh, um, so why can't why won't this let me share the screen? There we are.
that's the wrong one. Right, okay. Oh, I can't get the notes. Um, is that is that okay? Is that is that all right? Yeah. Okay, so this is some work. I'm sorry, I, I'm gonna if I I'm not gonna give this as well as that because I can't get at the notes and share the screen at the same time. But I'm going to try and give the talk, but I was involved with Nat in, in writing this paper up, so it won't be as good as him, but I will try and see if we can get through it. So I think the first thing to say, and I, I, I'm going to build on, we're going to sh uh, present some, some data from the study we did, uh, looking at the experiences of people with uh, disabled people in general, but we're going to look specifically at the data on learning disability, and I think to frame this at the start, it's really important to say that the health and social inequalities experienced by people with a learning disability are not new. I think this is one of the things that's come through. It's part of, uh, um, it's part of, it's, it's been there for a long time. We know that, I mean, at work that Angela was involved in uh, uh, as well with the Scottish Learning Disability Observatory showed the, 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 the increase, the, 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 you know, the, the, the increase in in, co in illness and, and uh, comorbidities for people with a learning disability. And I think their study showed that something like by the age of 20, people with a learning disability had the same level of comorbidities as people in the general public at 55. So I think it's to say that this is all part, it's, it's part of this, and, and we know the social inequalities experienced in terms of employment and so on, with 6% of disabled people with a learning disability being in jobs uh, can, so it's, I, I think to say that this is all framed within that. Um, one of the things that I think there's a danger that we come through when we talk about uh, the, 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 the data that Angela gave and, and, and the, the description that Eddie gave and, and so on, is that we see that this vulnerability, that we see people with learning disability as being vulnerable, and that vulnerability is inherent to them having a learning disability, rather than being resulted, the result of the way that, that society is organized. But as well as that, they're made much more vulnerable to getting COVID and much more vulnerable uh, to the impact of COVID by the structures that marginalize, exclude, and actively harm them. We know, I mean, Angela talked about the uh, inequality in uh, the, 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 the social, in, uh, the, the health inequalities that, uh, 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 that interfere with uh, learning disability to make people more vulnerable uh, to COVID. And people with a learning disability are more likely to live in poverty. So they're more likely to face both the, they've, they've got the, the, and so these two will combine and reinforce each other. And that they, they so as well as being, 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 having sort of a biological, if you like, vulnerability, they've also got a social vulnerability. And I think those two, but we seem to be focusing too much, I think at times on the biological vulnerability rather than on the social vulnerability and the way that we create people with a, there's a, not we here in this talk, but there's a danger that the media in general talk about that and create and 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 create that. So this is based on um, a series of interviews. We did two interviews with uh, uh, um, with people with a learning disability, 13 adults, six caregivers or family members of adults, and five caregivers of children, and 31 key informants from organisations of and for people with a learning disability in England and Scotland. Um, we carried out these interviews by Zoom or in a couple of cases uh, by email and uh, we interviewed people twice at the start of the pandemic of June 2020 and then a, a year in February to April 2021. We, conduct, we, um, we talked about work, we talked about education, we talked about leisure, we talked about social care, health and government response to the COVID, to the COVID pandemic. And, and uh, to, when we talked to people about how they, they went through. Um, I think I want to talk, there was a lot of things that emerged, but I want to talk about three, about four key themes that emerged across uh, um, the first of these. Was the first is the limited inclusion of people with a learning disability in pandemic response strategies, how they were completely forgotten about and how services didn't take into account their needs. The second was, is the, on the suspension of, of the impact of the, suspension and removal of social care and how this impacted on people with a learning disability and their families and I think this this is adding to both work that uh, Amanda and uh, Roseanne talked about and Eddie talked about and the third one is the impact of the pandemic on people's everyday routines and the way that the pandemic left many of them isolated and the final point I want to talk a little bit about is the initial uh, lack of vaccine support for people with learning disability and the fight for prioritisation. 
and how this impacted on their lives and, and what it tells us about uh, uh, the way that people are made vulnerable. So I think the first thing we'd say, you know, we, we titled this afterthought, lack of thought or no thought. And I think it's, it's hard to tell whether it was that they just didn't care, but people with learning disabilities felt invisible and ignored in the national response to the pandemic. Initially it started, and this is from Kelly in England in, in the first round of interviews. She said, when I watched them, news briefing she was talking about with mum, I never once heard the word learning disability. We were completely forgotten about. And then she got very close to crying. She said, do they ever think about people like us? But could they care less? No, do they care? No. And I think one of the things that we have to say at this time, that this leaving people out, ignoring them and making them feel, actually increased the anxiety because they didn't feel that they were included in, in anything. And it made people feel more, 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 more concerned and more worried about, uh, about the outcomes. And, and I think at the root of this problem was neglect and a limited understanding among, across the nations and among national and local actors on the needs and the way that people with a learning disability lead their lives. And this is from a, a, a chief executive officer of the National Learning Disability Organization said, I inveigled myself into a meeting of local authority uh, senior management uh, quite recently. And I was just fascinated about how little they knew about people with learning disabilities and how they little they knew about people in their communities who had learning disabilities. So I think it, we talk about this lack of thought, after, is it were they an afterthought, a lack of thought, or no thought? I think it is this, just no thought. People just didn't consider people with a learning disability at the start, because I think people didn't understand generally their needs, and they weren't seen as very important. Um, the lack, the lack of engagement and understanding is in, in, illustrated by the failure to provide information and guidance to people with learning disabilities in multiple and accessible formats. And this, I think, fits a lot with what Roseanne and uh, uh, Amanda have just said. So this is from Poppy. So the, the government should give more information. That's what I think. They should get more information. And I think they should explain it more to people with learning disabilities. Because some people don't understand what they're saying. Because I found out that their words, that they're using big words, not little words. They won't break it down. I think there's a clear lack of people just didn't know what was going on and this again really increased anxiety and created vulnerabilities within within the people. Um, I think again this echoes a lot of what both Eddie and uh, uh, Rosanna and Amanda have said there was a, a complete a dissolution of care and support so at, at the start of the pandemic many people saw their social care packages cut. Social care was removed overnight with little warning and no previous word and no further word from providers and no suggestion as to how or help with or ideas about how this report social care could be removed. So this is from Chris, a, a mother of Jim in, in Scotland. So the day centre called me about a month ago to say it was time for his review and they perhaps could and, and, and many received, sorry, no further word for, for, from providers. I mean, Chris told us in, in the interview that um, his social, his social, Jim's social care was just removed overnight. She was phoned up, told the social care was gone. Then they didn't get in touch. So the day centre called me maybe a month ago to say it was time for this review. And could they come round to do the review in the garden? I said, are you having a laugh here? You haven't seen him for five months. What is there to review? And I think there was just this complete lack of, uh, of going on down there. Um, people receive little or no guidance from the government or local authority for how they could get support in their home or how they could make that support uh, COVID secure. Um, there was a lot, if you remember, at the start of the pandemic, there was a lot of talk around PPE, but this PPE was the concern for PPE was for hospitals and for, uh, for uh, care homes. Very, but very few people talked about providing PPE for people living in domiciliary care, for people living in their own homes. And people simply couldn't get hold of it. And people weren't told how to make their home COVID secure if they had personal assistance coming in every day. Um, we were told of occasions where staff who normally worked with people with learning disabilities were transferred to work to care of the elderly people. People were told, well, you're working care. We want you to move in care of the elderly. And we don't think we, we it's almost as if suddenly the pandemic meant that the needs of people with a learning disability disappeared overnight and everybody was focusing on older people. So the shift of care staff also meant a lack of consistency in the delivery of care. And Donna, a mother of Ryan said to us, it made me understand 
that there was a complete lack of awareness of caring for someone in your own home in a national breakdown. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and not being even able to go out for work. That's unforgivable. I mean, I, I, I think one of the things I want to say, because it, it, I'd say here, one of the things that we talk about here, there's a danger we talk all the time about how dreadful it is to have a learning disability. And we, we create the idea that having a learning disability is, is a, a, it's a learning disability that's the problem. But that same person also did say, she said that it was really nice of me to spend 12 months with her son. She hadn't done that because she'd been rushing in and out of work. She hadn't done that for years. And she said it was just nice for them to spend all that time together. So uh, sometimes there's, there's a bit of good that comes out of it. But this is the dissolution of care. And this is from Abby, the sister of Morris, who was also his, his uh, care provider. It says, I think they feel that it's like people with disabilities are making special demands, wanting special treatment. But actually that's not really it. They just want the same outcomes as other people. They just want to live their lives. And I think there was a lack of recognition of what, what it was that people wanted. Um, I, I think uh, uh, with services uh, uh, closed during the pandemic, many participants felt really isolated and lonely. There was a, a sense of loss and worthlessness. And this again added to its feelings of anxiety and distress. And this is from a, a CEO of a national learning disability organization. That was really hard, you know. People were saying they felt they'd lost their children that their child was now so low in mood and, you know, lethargic, not carrying out activities, self-injurious behaviour, communicating in adverse ways, had put on weight, lost skills, not able to do things that they used to be able to do. And a couple of families saying, I don't know whether I'll ever have my son back again. So this disruption of care created real problems with, with, within, in terms of people's mental health, people's well-being, and people's anxiety. Um, I think that, that uh, uh, the, the other thing that, that, that happened during the pandemic, the, service, the closure of services and so on, um, for many people with a learning disability, their communities are built around day services. So they meet their friends when they go to, uh, uh, um, when they meet their friends when they go to the drama group or to the, the lunch group or to the, when these closed, their communities went and people became really lonely. And this increased anxiety and increased uh, um, feelings of, of separation and, and, and loneliness. And uh, a couple of people we spoke to had uh, uh, um, episodes that required uh, uh, psychiatric intervention because they were so low and so lonely during, during the pandemic because nobody had spoken to them and nobody had seen them. And, and some people, one of the, the people ended up, I think, you know, the, 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 the routines got so, so disrupted and they just didn't know wh where to go. Um, they, I think one of the things to say is that it's not all doom and gloom, because I, I think Eddie talked about this, that the third sector response was uh, uh, outstanding during the, during the pandemic across, across the country. And without the, uh, the, the flexibility without the, 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 the way that the third sector turned the ways they work around, the, the outcome would have been much worse than it was. They immediately, I mean, Eddie talked about they went online very quickly. Lots of organizations just changed the way they worked overnight. They went online, they ran online groups, they provided mental health support, they provided Zoom training, they, they, they went out. And I, I think um, I, one of the, uh, uh, participants with a learning disability I spoke to said that you know suddenly she she had she she lived in Inverness and she said I've got friends in Plymouth because these online groups became national and people started to talk so I think as well as the disrupted routines one of the things we have to talk about is in in terms of the positive was the way that the third sector responded and and the, the way that they were able to come together and actually they filled the gaps and they compensated for failures by the state, where the state had failed to step in and, and pick this pick this up, I think one of the things I'd like to say about the, the 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 disrupted routines and the lack of service was that we have in both England and Scotland we have that the minister is the minister for health and social care, but during the pandemic they became the minister for health because I I, I and I'm not it's not blaming I'm not blame well anyway um, I'm not one of the problems is I think that is really difficult to have the bandwidth to, to focus both on the real problems that, were, that, were, that the healthcare, health sector were experiencing and also to take account of the social care. And nobody was speaking for social care. Because, and it's one of the problems I think we've got with integration 
is that health has dominated. And it's one of the things that we need to think about if we go through in, into the forward is how we, we stop this happening. Um, and the final point I want to focus on is people with learning disabilities were initially, initially ignored uh, um, for uh, vaccine priority, despite early evidence that they had a high risk of morbidity and mortality. And uh, Angela has talked about this, and, Eddie, uh, and and so I was in a meeting, this is a CEO again from a disability organization. Uh, it's not all the same CEO, so don't, don't it's not all one, it, it, it's a different one. I said, so that what I'm actually saying, trying to help with here, is the efficacy of the administration of your vaccine program. And the, and the response I got was, that would be taking somebody else's vaccine. And I think there's a real danger that, that, that one of the things that we happen in, it, with the vaccines, it took national campaigns by, by uh, uh, advocates and, and particularly by siblings, by famous, by, by, by nationally known uh, uh, non-disabled people speaking about their siblings to bring this to the fore. It wasn't done on evidence. It was done around campaigns like and, uh, and, uh, uh, Joe Wiley and, and other people who brought this out to the fore. And it wasn't being done. So I think, again, this, this sort of shows the way that people with learning disability were made vulnerable because they weren't considered, their needs weren't considered. And even when people were placed in, in a, a priority group, there was often no accommodations made at the vaccination centre. It's the same building, there's no facility. There would be uproar, wouldn't there, with no wheelchair access to a building for, for vaccinations. But that is exactly the same, accessibility. So people who, 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 for whom being in uh, rooms with lots of people, lots of other people become a problem or a challenge, found it very difficult to go to vaccines. They had to queue up for long times and there wasn't accommodation made to meet their needs. So I think the thing to say is that, that to finish um, the discussion, I think, I think just to say that people with learned disability were neglected. I think that's quite a common theme that's run throughout everything people have said today. Um, government action and inaction expose people with learning disabilities to, to, to real harm and damage. And, and I think the pandemic, is, is, if it's revealed anything, it's revealed how poorly their needs are understood and how rarely people with a learning disability are considered in policy planning. It's exposed the gap in knowledge and it's exposed the fact that actually we don't really think about them and we need this redress in government policy that Roseanne and uh, Amanda so uh, clearly sort of articulated. And just to finish with this final quote from Sally from, from Scotland, she said, I think we've just been pushed under the carpet because I don't think the government give a damn. As long as they're okay and they've got their wage packet, they don't give a, excuse my language here, they don't give a toss. And I think that's, that's how people with learning disability, that sums up how they, were, they felt they were exposed during the pandemic. So thanks very much.